How could you love the idea of the Lord himself shouting and the heavens opening and the last trump and the voice of the archangel and the myriads of angels and the nations separated like sheep and goats and yet maintain that it would be the kind of event that wouldn't even make it into a mediocre historian's footnotes? Come on, man. Introduction. In the mid-60s of the first century, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy about a number of pastoral problems that confronted that earnest young man. One of the challenges had to do with a certain false teacher named Hymenaeus, who comes up in both 1st and 2nd Timothy. The first time, he is paired with a man named Alexander, who is probably the same man as the coppersmith who comes up separately in 2nd Timothy. This Alexander was a bad dude also. Quote, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. 1 Timothy 1, 18-20 about a year later, this Hymenaeus is teamed up with a gent named Philetus, and we learn a bit more about the nature of the error he was promulgating. The content of his doctrine was that the resurrection was already a past event. The thing to note is that Paul took this to be a really serious error, and as we note this, we need to look at the timestamp. Quote, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. 2 Timothy 2, 16-18 Now how important was it to Paul to refute the teaching of Hymenaeus? How serious was this error? Here's the summary. Those who err in this way put away a good conscience, 1 Timothy 1.19. They make a shipwreck of their faith, 1 Timothy 1.19. They fall into blasphemy, 1 Timothy 1.20. They deserve to be delivered over to Satan, 1 Timothy 1.20. It gives way to profane and empty chatter, 2 Timothy 2.16. It grows up into ungodliness, 2 Timothy 2.16. This teaching will grow like cancer or gangrene, 2 Timothy 2.17. It falls into error from the truth, 2 Timothy 2.18. 18, and it overthrows the faith of some, 2 Timothy 2, 18. Pretty dang serious, in other words. Now, this second letter was written around 66 AD, and according to the full preterists, all the prophecies of Scripture were fulfilled by 70 AD. This means that Hymenaeus was just four years off. He said that everything was fulfilled and passed, and if the full preterists are correct, that wouldn't be the case for another 48 months yet. And yet, despite this, it is quite striking that Paul accused him of some pretty serious misdoing. Was this because he struggled with basic math? Did Hymenaeus forget to carry the two? First order errors and first order threats. Given the seriousness of this kind of error, and it really is serious, I have been asked to explain the difference between my reaction to the revoice travesty, a reaction which was loud and exuberant and continues down to the present day, and our comparatively muted response, thus far, to the controversy over Gary DeMar's lack of responsiveness to the questions put to him about full preterism. Those questions were posed first in a private letter and then in a public one. It should be noted that I was a signatory to the letters that posed those questions. Why the difference in our response to date? The first and fundamental reason is that there's a difference between first-order errors and first-order threats. Let me define the difference because this is important. What is a first-order error? Any messing around with the doctrines found in the early ecumenical creeds would be examples of first-order errors, e.g. denying the Incarnation, or the deity of Christ, or the fact that God is Almighty, or the final coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone who is in error on something like this is, at a minimum, playing around with heresy. But we need to be careful here because the early ecumenical creeds aren't scripture, and it is possible for responsible Christians to think that Christ's descent into Hades is a simple reference to the grave, which it isn't. That puts them out of step with an early ecumenical creed, but it doesn't make them heretics. But in the main, on the sorts of doctrines I outlined above, to deny such teachings is to be guilty of heresy. It would be a first-order error. The Reformational creeds define the differences between the Reformed and Lutherans and Roman Catholics. The Ecumenical creeds define the differences between Christians and non-Christians. And so, to be guilty of a first-order error is very serious indeed. But a first-order threat is in a different category, and the definition of this depends on the circumstances and how many people are being affected. 
If someone hammers out his own little version of a monothelite heresy, the idea that Christ had only one will, and he has a little theology club that meets monthly in the back of a local coffee emporium with three to five persons in attendance, the error they are entertaining really is a first-order error. But it is not a first-order threat because nobody is listening to them. Nobody cares what Hobart P. Longworthy III is teaching back there. The monothelite heresy is a true heresy, but it is not the heresy of the moment. It is not the heresy du jour. The Revoice Project is both a first-order error and a first-order threat. Sexual confusion has swamped the world outside the church, and the church itself has taken on a great deal of water. The sexual chaos all around us is a global frenzy and an assault on the image of God and man, which in turn is an assault on the doctrine of God himself. The lusts that have been unleashed in the name of all that is woke are lusts that will burn down the world and are already burning down large portions of it. Arianism was a first-order threat in the days of Athanasius, which is why he had to stand contra mundum. It remains a first-order error promulgated by the Jehovah's Witnesses, and if you join the local kingdom hall, you really are walking away from the faith once delivered. But the Jehovah's Witnesses are not about to take over anything important. The JWs are not a first-order threat. If someone in your church joined the JWs, he should be excommunicated, because it really is a first-order error. But if your church took out a 30-second ad during the Super Bowl halftime to attack the pending threat of Arianism, this would be what we should call an overreaction. Having said all this, one of the things we have to keep in mind is that Paul does warn us that the error of full preterism is something that can certainly become a first-order threat. He tells us this when he says that it can spread, quote-unquote, like gangrene. So that should always be kept in mind as well. Not playing into anybody's hands. So allow me to talk for a moment about tactics in dealing with errors and threats. Suppose I'm looking at my Twitter feed, minding my own business, and some outrageous accusation pops up against me. The thing really is over the top, and it could be easily refuted. The first thing I do is click on that person's profile. The information I usually gain is that this person has 17 followers. If I reply, what have I done? I have made some troll's day. I have handed him a microphone and told him to please articulate his slander clearly. Why would I do something as stupid as that? But suppose I click on the profile and the person has 130,000 followers, and let us say that the accusation is just as outlandish as the one made by the first guy. Now what? Now I answer, and the reason I answer is that he has just handed me the microphone. He has made my day. These are not moral considerations. They are tactical considerations. In my experience, full preterists generally fall into Churchill's definition of a fanatic as those who can't change their minds and who won't change the subject. They are itching for a debate, itching for airtime. They want access to the microphones. One of the really unfortunate things about this whole controversy is that if someone of Gary DeMar's stature starts interacting with this error the way he has, then the controversy that erupts could easily advance the cause of the error whether or not Gary holds to it. That could still happen anyway, but I don't want to help it to do so. Now, somebody out there is sure to say, yeah, afraid to debate the issues, are you? You've just told us that you're trying to avoid a public debate with a qualified full preterist. Yep. <laughs> the reason for this is simple. One of the qualifications of an elder is that he be able to refute those who contradict. Titus 1.9. True enough. This is something I have already done. But the same apostle also tells us that there are circumstances under which you must refuse to talk with them anymore. Titus 3.10. Refusing to debate is not necessarily a fear of debating. If the error starts to spread like gangrene, like all our sexual heresies have already done, then yes, absolutely, let us engage. But not until then. Current plans. So, full preterism in my book really is a first-order error. I don't believe it is a first-order threat, which means that addressing it is not yet an all-hands-on-deck situation. And that means we can proceed with all due haste, but without our hair on fire. When I look at the fact that Gary, an honorable man, told me personally that he is not a full preterist, and I look at my schedule and other responsibilities, and then I look at the fact that the genuine full preterists, all 14 of them, would love nothing more than a full-tilt internet controversy on this topic, which would have the effect of handing them a microphone, I am disinclined to drop everything in order to make them happy. But the issue still must be dealt with. When sexual revolutionaries promote their madness and I answer them, I don't have to worry about handing them a microphone. They own most of the microphones in the world already. That is the reason for the different responses. 
There's a practical side to this. Gary DeMar is platformed in various ways by both Fight Laugh Feast and Canon Plus, both located here in Moscow and both an important part of our suite of ministries. The leadership of both Fight Laugh Feast and Canon have asked the session of Christ Church for guidance and direction on what they should do about it. We ask them to hold tight until we have our conversation with Gary, which we are in the process of setting up. If the allegations prove to have been correct, then the Orthodox will have no grounds for disappointment in our response. If they are not correct, then perhaps some of the Orthodox will be grateful that we refuse to be hasty. Returning to the Return of Christ I began by pointing to Paul's vigorous reaction to Hymenaeus. We should conclude all of this by pointing to several other things he said in the same epistle about the Return of Christ. Quote, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Hymenaeus was saying that the quote-unquote appearing had already happened, but this was obviously untrue because when the Lord came, Paul said he was going to judge the quick and the dead, and Hymenaeus was not yet judged. He was still carrying on in his errors. One of the reasons we know the Lord has not yet returned is that full preterists are still here, carrying on the way they do. Quote, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. 2 Timothy 4.8 At the end of the day, we must realize that the failure of full preterism is the same failure that undergirds all heresies. It always comes down to a lack of love. Notice how Paul speaks of it here. He refers to faithful believers as those who, quote, love is appearing. Hymenaeus clearly didn't love the Lord's appearing because he was willing to represent it as having been something of a dud. How could you love the idea of the Lord himself shouting, and the heavens opening, and the last trump, and the voice of the archangel, and the myriads of angels, and the nations separated like sheep and goats, and yet maintain that it would be the kind of event that wouldn't even make it into a mediocre historian's footnotes? Come on, man. Quote, for he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. Psalm 98, verse 9, NKJV. But be careful. If you blinked, you might have missed it.